Welcome to Bulag Analyst Network. My name is Mechid Paiman and I'm your host for today's episode of our podcast. The article by Akram Gizabi is titled U.S. Withdrawal from Afghanistan and its Aftermath from November 27, 2020 and published on Bulag Analyst Network's official website, bulag.org. U.S. Withdrawal from Afghanistan and its Aftermath Recently, the U.S. daily The Wall Street Journal published an article titled Afghanistan Braces for War as U.S. Troops Withdrawal Accelerates. The paper talks about the situation in the country and then highlights a local commander, Abdul Ghani Adipur, a Hazara from central Afghanistan who commands a group of fighters numbering about 500. He is quoted as saying that he could increase the fighters to 5,000 in a short notice. The paper gives the views of some Afghan and Taliban officials about the possibilities of violence in the future in the event of American withdrawal from Afghanistan. The paper singles out Alipur as the Hazara commander who, according to some government sources, fights against Pashtuns and is involved in illegal activities against the people. Who is Alipur and what he does? First, a bit of a background as to why the Hazaras need a popular force like Alipur's, especially after the U.S. untimely and hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan and its dealing with the Taliban terrorists, who during their takeover of Mazar-i-Sharif in 1998, massacred thousands of Hazara civilians. Secondly, since the Hazara uprising against the extremely oppressive Pashtun leader Abdurrahman, who at the behest of the British Raj started a genocidal war against the Hazaras in the 1890s. More than 60% of the Hazaras were massacred and the remaining ones were driven out of their lands and some of them were sold to slavery. Only a small portion of the land, mostly the central highlands called Hazarajat or Hazaristan, were left to them. After the demise of Abdurrahman, a terrible legacy of racism, discrimination and enmity were left among the people, especially with respect to Hazaras. One of the measures taken by Abdurrahman that sowed the seed of conflict and discontent that continues to date was the confiscation of the land and the right to use the Hazara hills, mountains and valleys as pasture lands for the nomadic Pashtuns. Each spring, an army of nomads descends on the central highlands and against the will of the locals graze their mountains and valleys and, on their way, back and forth trample the cultivation of the people. Successive Pashtun governments have ignored the Hazara pleas for mercy. During the insurgency against the Soviets and their installed regimes in the 1980s and also in the early 1990s, the locals refused to allow the nomads seasonal invasion. When the Taliban, which are overwhelmingly Pashtuns, took over, they helped the nomads to re-enter the Hazara regions. After the Taliban downfall post 9-11, each year the nomads return and the fighting with the local population resume ending up in death and destruction. Once again, the local pleas have fallen on deaf ears of the Pashtun governments. When the Taliban re-entered in certain areas, the first group that they started to fight against was the Hazaras. Throughout the years that the international forces were in Afghanistan, the Taliban terrorists targeted the Hazara population wherever they had access to them. The roads between Kabul and the central regions have been death traps for the Hazaras. The central government failed to secure the road through the Pashtun areas and the Taliban have made it a routine practice to search passing vehicles and single out those that are suspected as government employees and civil servants. During the spring when the nomads return to the central highlands, the Taliban provide protection for these invaders. Since the government does not protect the local population, they have formed the Armed Protection Force. This local resistance force is not an aggressive but defensive entity protecting the defenseless people in the region. There are armed bands among all ethnic groups in Afghanistan, even in the capital. The fact that there is no fighting going on in their regions is that they do not have the yearly nomad invasion or the Taliban are not a threat to their safety and security. In places where the Taliban pose a threat to the people, there have been resistance and fighting. In fact, The Hazaras are the least armed group in the country. When the U.S. and NATO forces entered Afghanistan, the Hazaras naively believed that the Western forces, especially the U.S., which had the commanding role, would bring peace and stability to Afghanistan, and there is no need for arms and ammunition. They also believed that centuries of neglect and discrimination would end, and that billions of dollars in aid money that was poured into Afghanistan will also benefit every ethnic group in an equitable fashion. 
That was not to be, as the Hazaras and indeed the rest of the people of Afghanistan soon realized most of the money was spent on areas that were at war with the coalition forces. The peaceful regions of the central and northern Afghanistan were totally ignored, giving the impression that it pays to wage a war and insurgency and that peace has no dividend even in the eyes of the international community. Taliban from obscurity to prominence. The coalition forces, especially the US, let themselves be duped by Pakistan's duplicity. They let Pakistan manipulate the situation and play a double game of supporting the Taliban and paying a lip service to the coalition forces. As a result, the Taliban, once on the verge of total surrender, were given shelter, training, assistance to grow into a formidable force that after 19 years of hit and run tactic from across the border, forced the U.S. to agree to a face-to-face -face negotiation with the group. They reached a so-called agreement that the U.S. forces will leave Afghanistan and that the Taliban will not let the country be used by any foreign terror groups against the U.S. President Trump announced that he will reduce the U.S. presence by the end of the year to 2,500 troops. However, the Taliban have not kept their end of the bargain, and Al-Qaeda and other foreign terror groups are still embedded with the Taliban and are operating in Afghanistan. Worse yet, the U.S. forced the Afghan government to free nearly 6,000 Taliban prisoners from jail, some of them on death row. They rejoined the Taliban outfit and swelled and strengthened the rank of the terror group. For Afghans, the U.S. deal with the Taliban has proved disastrous because it gives legitimacy to a terror group and second gives Taliban a green light that as long as they do not attack American soldiers, they can do what they want. As a result, after the agreement was signed on February 29, 2020, there has been a steady increase in violence across the country. Not only that, the Taliban want to use the agreement as the basis for the so-called intra-Afghan dialogue that started on September 12, 2020, and over two months have passed without any progress. That agreement has no place with the Afghan government, as they were not a party to the deal. The negotiations were carried out with no involvement or consultation with the government, so it has no place in the process. The Taliban seemingly feeling stronger and bolder are opting on a delaying tactic. They use brute force in the field with an increase in violence across the country. They have taken some bold attacks even on the capital and other major cities, blocking highways and choking cities. They are hoping to weaken the Afghan government even further and seems not to be interested in negotiations or reaching an agreement. On the other hand, there seems to be no change in the Taliban position or attitude to the vital issues of concern for the majority of Afghans. If anything, we will be expecting a deterioration of the situation in the future. Yes, there will be more violence, more bloodshed and more armed groups popping up. When the US leaves a void, as it did after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, Others, especially regional powers, will be more than willing to fill that void. And yes, vulnerable people such as the Hazaras, who are disillusioned and disappointed by the hallow promises of the West about democracy, human rights, rule of law, freedom, equality, etc., will have to take up arms for their survival. When you are driven to the wall, you have no choice but to fight with whatever means at your disposal or to grasp the first hand that is extended to you. Fighting for your survival and self-defense are two tenets of life allowed under any law anywhere from time immemorial. Alipur is the commander of a popular resistance force who defends the local population against the Taliban and the nomads that are one and the same as far as the Hazaras are concerned. In this murky environment that dog eats dog and the vicious wolves are on the prowl, we expect more Alipurs in the future and we need each and every one of them to secure the safety of people.